Garcia, and another edition of Ham and Egg News, where we react to Ken Ham reacting to things. Though unfortunately, today we're reacting not to Ken Ham himself, but two of his Answers in Genesis employee proxies. Fortunately, he brought in a couple of giants. I'm Roger Patterson, joined today by Tim Chafee. And we think we've officially decided this is the highest average height. Yes. Tim and I are both over 6'6", six, six, so we think we've, we've reached that average height maximum for the show. Yikes. Hey, Roger, Wayne from YouTube says just don't tell any tall tales in the tall news. Oh, so. <laughs> <laughs> Bodie would appreciate that. He would. I miss Bodie. Yeah, we're going to gonna hear a tall tale in a little bit. But... Yeah, we've got a couple of those coming yes. up as well. We are going to hear a lot of tall tales in a little bit, but we will not all agree which parts are beyond credulity. All right, our first news item takes us today to Turkey. 3D scans show boat-like formation matching biblical description of Noah's Ark, archaeologists say. Oh no, here we go again, because we see this, uh, this particular claim, this particular site in Turkey, popping up very regularly. On June 20th, 1987, in the mountains of Ararat, Turkey officially recognized the discovery of Noah's Ark. Located on a mountainside about 15 miles south of the volcanic Mount Ararat, the remains of the massive ship were dedicated during a special ceremony. Guest of honor was Ron Wyatt due to his 10 years of research at the site. Yeah, this is one that is the Duro Pinar site is what it's known as, and it was popularized uh, quite a bit in the 1980s by Ron Wyatt, uh, who claimed to have discovered Noah's Ark along with a bunch of other uh, biblical artifacts or other things. If the stories about Ron Wyatt are to be believed, he's the single most accomplished archaeologist who ever lived. Indiana Jones, including all his finds in the comics, novels, and video games, would have nothing on Ron. He claims to have made over 100 Bible-related finds, including all the big ones. Ron Wyatt discovered the temple furniture right under where Jesus was crucified. I believe he really found Noah's Ark, and I believe he really found the grain bins where they stored the grain, for jo Joseph stored the grain in Egypt. He claimed he discovered the crossing site for the Red Sea. I believe he did. He discovered the real Mount Sinai, and there's an altar where they apparently sacrificed the golden, or made the golden calf. That's still there. He found hundreds and hundreds of sulfur balls. These must have come from heaven, since they are not found anywhere else on this planet. Ron Wyatt, who discovered the actual Ten Commandments, are still in the Ark of the Covenant. Now, Ron uh, Wyatt built a pyramid block lifting machine. He went over there, digging in that area, and found the grave of Mrs. Noah. Mrs. Noah was 11 feet tall, according to what Ron Wyatt said. While Wyatt is widely renounced in both archaeology circles and religious circles, there seems to be never-ending adherence by those not particularly inclined to dig for confirmation and evidence. And people say, how did one man find so many things? Well, how much time did you spend over there looking for things? <laughs> he spent a lot of time over there. If I was God, he's the kind of guy I would let find those things because he was not looking for any glory. Fortune and glory, kid. Fortune and glory. And they, they, at the time, they did a little bit of a scanning on one end, and they claimed that, see, we found uh, what looked like beams underneath there, and that this, this is going to be the ark. And um, several Christians, geologists, researchers have actually gone over there. They've done research, and no, it's not. <laughs> yeah, none of it pans out. We've, yeah, we've got an article by uh, our own geologist, Dr. Andrew Snelling, uh, which was done in 1992. Wait a minute, 1990, that's, that's been a couple yeah. days. We've been showing that this is not the ark. Sometimes people look at it and say, you just don't want it to be because you have... You just don't want it to be true. Welcome to the world of my comment section, Tim. We would love it to be, okay? Let's be honest. Every one of us affiliated with the ministry would love to actually find the remains of Noah's Ark. That would be fantastic. But what we don't need are false claims. Yes. We don't need people saying it is that and trying to drum up support or whatever they're doing. And I'm not saying these people are intentionally being de deceptive. That's not. I'm not claiming that. But we don't need to to make up evidence to support scripture. Does that make sense? We already have God's word, and yeah. it's true from the beginning to the end. We don't need to, to find these things that, that aren't accurate. While I agree with this sentiment, one could understandably suspect that making up evidence to support scripture is the Answers in Genesis mission statement. If God's word were sufficient, 
Why would we need a creation museum, an Ark Encounter attraction dedicated to bolstering the stories using narratives that many Christians acknowledge are speculative, based on partial truths, ignore important data, misrepresent, or are outright fabricated? For examples, see the full back catalog of Ham and Egg News episodes, or check out this great documentary that friend of the channel Gutsick Gibbon recently produced on everything wrong with the Creation Museum and Ark Encounter. And I can be generous and give the same disclaimer that Tim did. I'm not saying that any particular AIG staff member or follower are being intentionally deceptive, but that doesn't mean that they aren't promoting things that aren't accurate. Now, if we happen to find Noah's Ark, that would be awesome. I don't think that we will. Why? Well, it's made out of wood. And how many of you have seen things made out of wood that last for hundreds and hundreds of years? Let alone 4,300 years. So, yeah, I mean, okay. you drive by an old farmhouse or the barn that's 100 years old, the barn's already caving in and starting to rot away. It's just wood doesn't do a great job out in the elements. And there's always people, well, but what if it was trapped in ice? Then that glacier moves and it rips it to shreds. Okay, yes. so you might find some timber in there, but it's not it's not going to be a yeah, whole art. We're not going to find anything intact. Right. So the, um, the details that you'll find in this article by Dr. Snelling deal with some of those initial ideas. It's amazing how AIG can do some actual debunking when they want to. Reminds me of that Flat Earth episode they did a few years back. Though in a way that's more discouraging than if they were incapable. But we humans are better at applying skepticism to things we don't already believe than the things that we do. All of us myself included, need to be aware of this kind of bias to have any hope of keeping it in check. And really, there's nothing, there's not a lot new. Now, the new claim is that recent studies that have been done in the last few years using ground penetrating radar, GPR, have showed that there are layers that are consistent with what they think would be decks of wood that would be inside the ark here. So they've secured um, more uh, funding research and opportunities to go in with permits and look at this site. Now, there's nothing wrong with analyzing these things and trying to understand these things better. But what we really uh, have to think about is the motives and the uh, intentions behind this. We know for certain that Noah's Ark was a reality. Why? Because it's recorded for us in the pages of Scripture. And even if a skeptic were to see this wooden boat structure that was found as an archaeological artifact, does that mean they're going to believe the Bible and everything it says? No, if it, they would come up with some story to, to fit, well, okay, so maybe there was an ark, or maybe it was a local flood that got it up to this area, or maybe some people went up there later and built this thing. I mean, there's all sorts of things they would come up with it rather than, uh, you know what, I guess I better repent and, yeah. and believe. Well, in a hypothetical scenario of finding a large ancient boat, those would all be conclusions with fewer assumptions than a supernaturally designed vessel that navigated a global flood. Verifying details, like perhaps only one opening or exact dimensions, could help a more cumulative case that, for me, would need to include confirmation in the geology of the earth, paleontology, archaeology, and the like. Because believing these things that scripture records for us is a matter of faith. We trust in these things by faith. There's always debate among Christians about exactly what biblical faith is. But I think it's clear here that in this context, Roger means something other than confidence or trust. Here, faith is some kind of replacement for evidence. Now, that doesn't mean it's a blind faith. Right. Okay? Yep. We have evidence that supports these things, but we trust in these things because they're, they're found in God's Word. And there, uh, there's more information in this article, Has the Ark Been Found?, written by Tim. And he talked about some of the, ex the people have gone on explorations there and the, the evidence that they've found. And it's, it's actually just a geologic formation. It happens when you get mud flows coming down a mountain and if there's some obstruction that hits it and it carves the Close area around, around it. And if, if you, you can look at that site on Google Maps. You type in Noah's Ark Turkey, it'll take you right there. And you can, zoom, you can zoom out a little bit, you can see that shape, and then just start hovering around. Look around in other areas, and guess what you'll find? A bunch of shapes just like that. This one just happens to be similar to the, the, the size of the Ark. Now it's about 560 feet in length, so that's 50 feet longer than what we built down in Williamstown. It's but, a pretty so you'd large have to, cubit. You'd have to have a cubit that's about my size, 22-inch cubit. The Ron Wyatt people explain this away by saying that Egyptian cubits were longer, and because the Bible claims that Moses was raised in Egypt, that he would have used the longer ones. But Ron again went to the Bible to learn more. Moses was the author of the Genesis account of the flood. He would have known the cubit of the Egyptians. The Hebrew cubit didn't come into existence until there was a Hebrew nation after Moses' death. Setting aside that Moses wouldn't have written this part of the story, 
something we'll talk about later in the video, it also implies that Moses would then be altering what God told Noah, since God would have told Noah the Hebrew measurements, not the translation to Egyptian measurements. Moses would have been messing with God's words. When I was a biblical inerrantist, such interpretations would not have been acceptable. And so the that's only one of the dimensions. So when they mentioned it's the arc of biblical dimensions, they're only talking about the length. What about the width? Right. It's much wider than the biblical width. So, so they the have to say, fell out and... oh, well, the walls fell out. And they're trying to explain that part away. And they don't know how deep this, this structure is. Yeah. So just because it claims to be the biblical dimension, notice dimension, <laughs> not dimensions of the ark, doesn't mean that that's true. Okay, So those things aren't necessarily lining up. So just be careful with these things. And we've got some good research on our website that you can... Uh, connect people with as these ideas come up. Well, if anyone in your life tries to tell you that they've found Noah's Ark, I guess it's good that you can say, not even Ken Ham believes that. Hopefully he's an acceptable source to them. And maybe his disagreement a bit of a wake-up call. I do not know what Ken Ham believes on this topic. It doesn't matter. He's got his own ministry, and God bless him. hope he does great. But uh, I, I teach what I think to be true. I've met him a couple times. I'll, I'll ask him if I see him again. I, I love what he's doing. Praise God. He's not the enemy. We differ on a few little things, but hey, you can't be right on everything. He's trying. Okay. I am, but that's okay. Uh, William Lane Craig explores the headwaters of the human race. This comes to us from Christianity Today. Now, if you're familiar with William Lane Craig, he is a uh, most often known as a philosopher and theologian. If you're a regular viewer of the channel, you might remember videos about Dr. Craig's Kalam argument, morality argument, reliability of scripture, and a bit of a spirited back and forth on the resurrection of Jesus. The uh, man who has responded goes by Paul Logia. He says he'd been a Christian for 30 years and never heard that dinosaurs lived millions of, of years ago, so that when he learned that, this really shook him to the core in his faith. But also, earlier this year, we had a special episode of Ham and Egg News covering the ongoing cross-media feud between William Lane Craig and Ken Ham. While it's not Ken himself speaking today, but rather his oversized stand-ins, it looks like the release of Craig's new book has renewed some hostilities. Who presents a lot of ideas based in uh, the Big Bang cosmology and teaching ideas out of that and is now dealing with uh, writing a systematic theology book. And the book In Quest of the Historical Adam is the fruit of my work on um, the person of Adam and Eve uh, and the subject of human origins. And rather than sticking with what we would understand to be a biblical interpretation of uh, Adam and Eve being the first two humans who were specially created by God in a supernatural act, he's leaning toward a little bit different view of those things. Well, young earth creationists who believe that the world was created around 6,000 years ago in six literal 24-hour days, who believe that um, a few thousand years ago there was a worldwide flood that exterminated all terrestrial life on Earth, who believe that all of the world's languages stem from confusion out of Babylonian ziggurat called the Tower of Babel, are going to think that I'm compromising hmm. on these biblical truths. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> he has been, uh, over time, uh, he's been buying into a lot of the, the billions of years. In fact, for a long time, he's been promoting that. And in one of the most startling developments of modern science, we now have pretty good evidence that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning about 13 billion years ago in uh, a cataclysmic event called the Big Bang. I remember trying to listen to his series on the Gospel of John where that he was teaching in Sunday school, and he, he just couldn't stop talking about the Big Bang over and over and over again. He just kept pushing the Big Bang. I thought, what does that have to do with John? And I would say that the Big Bang Theory is the most successful model that exists today um, with regard to the evidence. It explains very well uh, all of the evidence that we have, um, and it, there doesn't seem to be any evidence on the other side. It was all in the beginning, I mean, several classes, but he just seems like he can't talk about anything having to do with creation without trying to push the Big Bang cosmology, which is strange, um, because it is not consistent with the Bible in, in any way, shape, or form. We've got articles on our website, Terry Mortensen outlines 23 differences in the order of events between Genesis 1 and the Big Bang um, evolutionary idea. So you can't just say, this is the way God did it, unless you're going to completely reinterpret Genesis 1. You know, I don't know, Sean, Hmm. if there was a kind of universal way of interpreting these passages. Uh, one of the things that I rebuke Old Testament scholars for 
in the book is the presumption of saying things like ancient Egyptians believed that or ancient Mesopotamians believed that. I don't think we know what most Egyptians or Mesopotamians or ancient Israelis uh, believed. But I think we can say that there are elements in these stories that exhibit the sort of mythological literary genre, which the author and his audience would have recognized to be fantastic if they were taken literally. Uh, And that therefore that gives good reason to think that they were not always taken in a literal way. Well, lately he is now reinterpreting Genesis 2 and 3, which does not surprise a lot of us um, who have followed him. And by the way, I'm not, I don't want this to sound like I'm saying the guy's not a believer. I know sometimes we get people who get really fired up about this, like, oh, he's, he's not even a Christian. He's going to burn. He's all that, that, that's not the issue here. Well, I open the book with a quotation from the Old Testament scholar Richard Averbeck, who says, anybody who writes on the first few chapters of Genesis is going to be in a lot of trouble with a <laughs> lot of people. <laughs> and that's regardless of your views. I appreciate that the next line in the book, you said, look, whether you agree with me or not, this is the result of a lot of thought and reflection. And I just plead for a sober assessment of the views. And I think that's fair. And I hope people on the left and the right and everywhere else will approach it that way. So don't respond that way, but an- analyze the argument rather than attacking the person. Analyze the argument. What is, is he, he saying? teaching a serious error here? Yeah, he's teaching would, a very we serious say, error. We would say and, so. And he'd be the first, he would be right at the front of the line saying, yes, believe in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. But when it comes to this, he's saying, yeah, you can't trust the Bible the way it's written, like the literal way, because it's mytho history. From the call of Abraham in chapter 12 on, you have straightforward historical narrative. But Genesis okay. 1 to 11 is acknowledged by every New Testament commentator to be a part from the rest of Genesis to be a special sort of narrative and a peculiar genre of literature. And the classification of this genre as mytho-history, and my point was that Genesis 1 to 11 belongs to another genre of literature, namely mytho-history, that is also not to be read in a literalistic way. But I could have made the comparison with, say, the poetry of the Psalms or the wisdom literature of the Proverbs or even the parables of Jesus. Uh, The point is not to say these all belong to the same literary genre, but simply to say that the Bible contains types of literature that are not properly read in a literalistic way in the way that, for example, historical literature or biographical literature is to be read. Roger, what is mytho-history? What What do we mean by mytho-history? We're not talking about myth in the popular sense of the word, like the myth of the self-made man or the myth of the low-calorie diet. So we want to make sure we handle this fairly. When you hear the word myth, you probably think of something that's not true, but that's not the way he's intending this. So let's let his own words speak for what he means. And a lot of people in literature and everything don't mean that either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. So he means by mytho-history. We are talking about myth in the way that folklorists and classicists use that term to differentiate it from things like folk tales and legends. A myth in this sense is a traditional sacred narrative that attempts to ground realities contemporaneous with the author, uh, including a society's institutions and values and natural phenomena, in events of the deep primordial past. And I think you would agree that that description fits Genesis 1 to 11 to a T. And the problem comes when we get to the next part of his understanding of what Genesis 2 and 3 specifically communicate. And he calls these fantastic elements. And this is where we really run into some significant problems with his theological understanding. He said he starts to talk about the Epic of Gilgamesh, and he compares some of the things in the Epic of Gilgamesh to the Bible and how there's fantastic elements like the bull Taurus, which is the constellation coming down to earth and wrestling that and then cutting it up into pieces and distributing the meat. That's a fantastic tale. Right, and he even says that, that these are so extraordinary as to be palpably false. As I show that the New Testament authors cite mythological and hmm. uh, fabulous figures from... Jewish folklore and Greek mythology that I think none of us want to be committed to historically. And so these would be prime examples of where the New Testament authors are using these literary figures to illustrate 
Christian doctrines and truths, but they don't require us to believe in the historicity of those figures. In some of these cases, we have really good grounds for thinking mm. it's not historical. Mm. For example, the figures of Janus and Jambres mm. that are referred to in 1 Timothy, you can show the history of this pair in Jewish folklore, how it evolved. And the wild legends about Janus and Jambres and the magicians' contests they had with Moses and all the rest, it, it, to, to think that this is really historical would be a wild stretch of the imagination. Or the example in 1 Corinthians, where Paul talks about this well that traveled along with the Israelites through the desert during their wilderness wanderings. In Jewish folklore, there was this well about the size of a beehive that kind of rolled along on the ground, and then every night it would stop, and it would yield water for the Israelites to drink out of. And Paul refers to this legend and says, and that well was Christ. Hmm. Now, are you going to say that that identification requires you to believe that this story about this traveling well is true? I don't know anybody who thinks that's true. So, so if we take what's written in Genesis in a straightforward way, such as a talking serpent— or what he called a magical tree, which actually just automatically kind of poisons the well against the Bible and yes. says a magical tree. I mean, when you read a story about two people in an arboretum with these magical trees whose fruit, if you eat it, will grant you immortality or knowledge of good and evil. And then there's this talking snake who comes along and tempts them into sin. And then you have this anthropomorphic God walking in the cool of the garden, calling out audibly, to Adam in his, in his hideout, you think, well, of course this is figurative uh, and metaphorical language. This isn't meant to be read in this sort of literalistic fashion. It's frustrating when you read this. Here's what he says later on, because here's what he's really getting to, is that Adam and Eve came from the apes. Now, he, this, is what he, this is where he's going with it, from ape-like ancestors. Now, uh, assuming then, for the sake of argument, the truth of evolutionary biology uh, okay. concerning human origins, we can imagine sometime prior to 750,000 years ago, a group of hominins, uh, maybe a, a few thousand. And through a biological and spiritual renovation, perhaps divinely induced, a, a miracle that caused a genetic regulatory mutation in a pair of these hominins, they were lifted to fully human status and capable uh, of supporting a rational soul through their brain and nervous system. Uh, and they would then begin to have children. And I think given their full humanity, they would naturally tend to isolate themselves from their non-human contemporaries. In time, eventually, they and their descendants would supersede all of the non-human descendants um, and eventually give rise to different species of human beings like Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, and Denise of Ants. What does the Bible say about the creation of man? That we came from a pre-existing being that looked like us? Where is the hominin form in that passage? So that by hominin, what he's meaning is there is some type of common descent. So we would believe in an evolutionary transition from some single-celled molecular structures all the way up to um, living things, all the way to ape-like creatures, some hominin or hominid form that then God refashioned to be the first human. Well, since my question is, am I as a Christian in conflict with contemporary science as a result of my biblical commitments, I simply accept what the deliverances of contemporary science are. Now, that doesn't mean that I believe in them or defend them. I simply assume them. I say, given that there was a historical Adam or that, that the Bible commits me to a historical Adam, then assuming what modern science has to say about human origins, okay. is there some conflict between my biblical commitments and the deliverances of contemporary science? And my okay. contention is that even given the full-blown theory of evolution of the human species, there's no incompatibility with um, my biblical commitment to uh, universal human uh, pair 
our progenitors. Right. And so he says that this is it's mytho history. So it's about real people and events in the language of a myth to ground a culture's identity. In other words, how is the culture that this is written to going to understand it? And he he says things like, well, they would never take it the way young earth creationists say it. He, they would take it. They would understand this is just fantastical stuff. Really? How did the that culture take it? Well, well I bet take, we have some other Bible authors who. Uh, yeah. So let's see. That. Let's see. We have Genesis 3:19 later in the same. Same author, obviously. It's just the yes. next chapter. The Genesis 1, 2, and 3 were written by the same author is not obvious. In fact, most Old Testament scholars agree that Genesis 1 was added centuries later by some sort of editor. It's one of the most obvious style and information changes in the Bible. At some point in their lives, most Christians notice that these chapters don't flow. They're telling a different story from different perspectives with different styles. Uh, when Ad, after Adam sins, God says, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. He didn't say ape-like creature. Man was made from the dust of the ground. That's the very next chapter. Okay, but that's still Genesis 1 through 11. That's mytho-history, right? It should prompt us not to be over-literalistic in the way we read these narratives. And once you begin to look at them in terms of mytho-history, it's difficult to look at them in any other way. So let's find something else. Uh, Psalm 90, verse 3, you, re you return man to dust and say, return, O sons of men. Return, well, how do you return to the dust unless you were dust in the first place? And who wrote Psalm 90, Roger? That's called the Psalm of David. No, it's Moses. Well, That's the minute. Psalm of Moses. Who's so the one that wrote Moses. Genesis? Moses. Well, no. Most scholars agree that Moses was not the author of Genesis. At the very least, not all of Genesis. The first five books of the Bible are clearly stitched together later. This is so obvious that answers in Genesis themselves are forced to affirm what they call a tablet model, or Toledoth model, where they propose Adam wrote the first tablet, then Noah the next tablet, then Noah's sons the next, and so on and so on. And then Moses later compiled them. Sorry, Tim. Even your employer disagrees here. But what about the New Testament? I mean, this is the Old Testament. Right? Well, what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 45, compare, talking about the future bodily resurrection? And he's using, well, listen to what he quotes. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. So he's quoting that passage from Genesis 2, where God yes. just made man from the dust. The last Adam, became, Christ, became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is the first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven, and as was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so are those who are, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Sounds pretty clear to me. It's very clear how that culture understood that passage, that man was made from the dust of the ground. You cannot get around that. So we can say it's not historical, but in 1 Corinthians 15 and Romans 5, you say it's also not just literary and we have reason to believe it is historical. Now we could parse these passages in great depth, but just tell us kind of as simply as possible why you think those passages are best interpreted as requiring a historical Adam. Very simply, because a literary figure cannot have effects outside of the literature in which that figure appears. The person Hamlet in the play by Shakespeare was supposed to be a Danish prince who actually lived, but there was no such person as Hamlet. So Hamlet can't have any sort of effects outside the play. But what Paul asserts about Adam is that through Adam, sin came into the world. And because of Adam's sin, all men died and sin reigned from Adam to Moses, a historical period of time. Uh, and we're still dealing with it today, says Paul. And so it seems to me that because of the extra literary effects of this figure, this figure cannot be purely literary, but must mm. be historical. We've got a book that deals with this whole search for Adam, because you've got a lot of different theologians out there, a lot of scientists who are writing books about Adam. Bill, our mutual friend Josh Swamadas has written a book recently on the uh, genealogical Adam and Eve. Uh, we have other books that are coming out and other friends. There's a ton of people talking about this. Trying to say, well, he was, when, when was first Adam and Eve? When were they? They were. So Dr. Craig says he, he places him at Homo heidelbergensis, which is 400,000 years ago. Well, or so. It would be somewhere between 1 million and 750,000 years ago. Now, that's a broad range, but sure. it, it does narrow down very considerably um, the candidates for who Adam and Eve might have been. I think the best candidate. Uh, is Homo Heidelbergensis, uh, or Heidelberg man, who is the most recent ancestor of Neanderthals, Denisovans, and Homo sapiens. 
Now, and so the, probably the most novel thing in the book is my proposal to identify Adam and Eve as Heidelberg man. Mm. That calculation made by Dennis Venema and others was based upon interpreting human beings to be restricted to homo sapiens. And you could not get an original pair of homo sapiens um, in the recent enough past to be able to explain the genetic diversification of our contemporary population. But you see, I think, as I said, that's a prejudicial identification. Neanderthals were just as human as homo sapiens. And so we need to push that original human pair back further in time to the most recent common ancestor of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. And when you do that, even Venema now agrees hmm. that any time earlier than 500,000 years ago, population genetics cannot rule out the existence hmm. of an original human pair who are the universal progenitors of mankind. Oh. It's, it's, it's very interesting. So here we have, we have a very clear case of are we going to put our trust in who Adam and Eve were in the ever-changing, very new concepts of biological evolution okay, that have only been developed in the last 150 years? Or are we going to look at the timeless word of God, the one who created these people and knows how they exist? And I have struggled mm -hmm. as best I can to weigh the evidence objectively to determine our biblical commitments. Now, I would be disingenuous, Sean, mm -hmm. if I were to say, I don't want the young earth creationist interpretation to come out true. Okay. Uh, to me, that is a nightmare. Uh, my, my greatest fear is that the young earth creationist might be right in his hermeneutical claim mm. that Genesis does teach those things that I described earlier. And I say that would be a nightmare because if that's what the Bible teaches, it puts the Bible into massive, I think, irredeemable conflict with modern science, history, wow. and linguistics. And I don't want that to happen. So, Yes, yes, it's true. I, okay. I don't want young earth creationist uh, <laughs> interpretation to okay. be right. But nevertheless, I really do in the book struggle to be as objective as I can in saying what did these narratives mean to their original audience when they were written and read. And the reason the gospel makes sense that I explained in my presentation here a little while ago is because it makes sense because of what happened in Genesis. The first man, Adam, brought sin, brought death into this world through his sin. Now, I myself don't hold to that classical doctrine of original sin. Mm. I think that that is neither taught in Genesis 3 nor in Romans 5. I think what Paul teaches is that Adam was the floodgate through which sin entered into the human race, and then sin spread to all men because, as Paul says, all men sin. Now, if that's right, it means Adam has to be a historical person, because again, if he were purely fictional, then sin could not have entered the human race through this individual. So I think that that requires a historical Adam. And I also think that the consequences of denying the historical Adam are very serious. They send reverberations through your theology that will affect, first of all, your doctrine of inspiration and then your doctrine of Christ. If it's true that Paul, for example, teaches that there was a historical Adam through whom sin came into the world, and yet that is false, then you have to say that the Bible teaches falsehoods. Hmm. Uh, and that is going to require you to revise your doctrine of inspiration in such a way that inspiration is consistent with the teaching of error. Moreover, hmm. since Jesus plausibly believed that Adam was a historical person, you're going to have to explain how Jesus can be divine and yet hold false beliefs. As I sit back and let these men have their say, I must affirm the great tension here. Like Craig, I found myself affirming the highly compelling evidence for an old earth and for common descent. And as Craig described, I had to revise my doctrine of inspiration. Unlike Craig, however, I came to a place where Jesus indeed believed in historical Adam meaning he was in error, and the dominoes fell to where I no longer believe. But Craig makes the point well that there are other options between Pologia and Answers in Genesis. If you take Dr. Craig's view, 
You've just undermined the gospel. It doesn't mean he doesn't believe the gospel, but he's undercut the historical foundation for it, the, bi the biblical and theological foundation for it as well. And would you say similarly, if Adam is not historical, our faith is in vain, or would you qualify it differently? No, I, I think that would be really misplaced theological priority, Sean. I, I would say that it would require you to revise your doctrine of inspiration and your Christology, but by no means would the denial of the historical Adam make you a heretic or separate you from salvation. In fact, in the opening chapter of the book, I explore a few of these worst case scenarios, mm. as I call them. I say, suppose my proposal doesn't work. Suppose mm. we're stuck with one of these worst case scenarios where the Bible teaches that there was a historical Adam, and yet there wasn't one. And I try to show that even given that worst case scenario, there are moves that we can make to preserve Orthodox um, Christian belief, even uh, given those reverberations. All right, that's all the time we've got for you today. We hope to see you back on Monday for Answers News. God bless. Whatever your position on Genesis 1, literal history, figurative history, a fictional legend, or something in between, I hope you found this discussion useful. Thanks for watching, and until next time, later. <laughs>